Hey there, folks. Welcome to, A Quick Note. Today, we're diving into the pages of history to unravel the gripping story of the Great Chicago Fire. So, grab a seat, and let's explore how this devastating event shaped the Windy City. If you enjoy quick, informative content, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more historical insights. The Big Chicago Fire was like a huge, destructive party that wrecked a big American city. It happened in the 1800s and was one of the worst disasters back then. It all started on a Sunday night in a barn, but the fire didn't stay put. Nope, it decided to play tag and spread super fast. For about 30 hours straight, the fire partied hard in Chicago, burning up houses where immigrants lived and the cool downtown area where businesses were. From the evening of October 8, 1871, until the early hours of Tuesday October 10, 1871, Chicago had no way to stop the crazy fire. It wasn't a fair fight, the fire was winning big time. Lots of homes, hotels, stores, newspapers, and even government offices got turned into ashes. It was a really sad scene. At least 300 people lost their lives in the chaos. People have argued about what caused the fire in Chicago for a long time. There's this story going around that a cow owned by Mrs. O'Leary kicked over a lantern and started the fire, but it's probably just a made-up tale. Still, that story got stuck in people's heads, and we still hear it today. What we do know for sure is that the fire did begin in a barn that belonged to the O'Leary family. Strong winds were like the fire's cheerleaders, pushing the flames to move fast and spread beyond the barn. A long summer drought. Back in the summer of 1871, Chicago was like an oven, super hot, and there was hardly any rain. It was so bad that from July to October, the city only got less than three inches of rain, and most of that was just quick showers. Now, the problem was, Chicago was like a wooden wonderland. Almost everything in the city was made of wood, and there was a lot of it because it was cheap and easy to find in the American Midwest during the 1800s. So, with all that heat and barely any rain, it was like the city was sitting on a big pile of matchsticks just waiting for something to spark it up. Back in the day, when Chicago was rapidly growing, they didn't pay much attention to the rules about building stuff and keeping things safe from fires. The city had huge areas where poor immigrants lived in poorly built shacks, and even the fancier houses of rich folks were mostly made of wood. A big city made mostly of wood, and then add a super dry spell. It was like a recipe for disaster. In September, a month before the fire, the Chicago Tribune, the city's top newspaper, called out the place for having buildings that were basically fire traps. They said many structures were just a mix of fakeness and wooden shingles. One of the issues was that Chicago had grown so fast and hadn't dealt with many fires before. Unlike New York City, which had learned its lesson from a big fire in 1835 and started making sure buildings followed safety rules, Chicago was kind of playing catch-up in the safety department. The fire began in O'Leary's barn. The night before the big fire, there was already trouble in Chicago, a major fire had broken out. All the city's fire crews rushed to fight it, and it seemed like they had managed to save the day. But then, on Sunday night, October 8, 1871, someone spotted another fire in a barn owned by an Irish immigrant family named O'Leary. Alarms started blaring, and a fire crew that had just finished battling the previous night's fire rushed over. Here's where things got tricky, there was a lot of confusion in sending out other fire crews, and it took a while to get everyone in the right place. Maybe, just maybe, if the first crew hadn't been so tired from the previous night, or if the other crews had been sent to the right spot sooner, they could have contained the fire at the O'Leary barn. But sadly, time was lost, and the fire had a chance to spread. In just 30 minutes after hearing about the fire at O'Leary's barn, chaos erupted. The flames jumped to nearby barns and sheds, then swiftly attacked a church, turning it into a blazing inferno. At this point, any hope of getting control was gone, and the fire started its unstoppable journey northward, heading straight for the heart of Chicago. Now, here's where the story takes a turn. A tale started going around that the fire began because Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over a lantern while being milked, setting hay in the barn on fire. Funny thing is, years later, a newspaper reporter admitted that he made up that story. But, you know how legends are, they stick around. So, even though it's not true, people still talk about Mrs. O'Leary's cow starting the big fire. The fire spread. The conditions were just right for the fire to go wild, especially once it moved beyond O'Leary's barn. It picked up speed real fast. 
Burning bits landed on furniture factories and grain storage towers, and then the flames started gobbling up everything in their way. Fire crews tried their hardest to control it, but when the city's water system got wrecked, the fight was pretty much over. The only choice left was to run for it, and that's exactly what tens of thousands of people in Chicago did. About a quarter of the city's roughly 330,000 residents hit the streets, grabbing whatever they could in a total panic. Imagine this crazy scene, a massive wall of flame, like 100 feet high, charging through the city blocks. Survivors told terrifying stories of strong winds pushing burning embers around, making it seem like fire was raining down from the sky. It was a real-life nightmare. When Monday morning rolled around, the sun came up to a devastating sight in Chicago. Huge chunks of the city were already turned into piles of ash, wooden buildings just vanished. Even the stronger brick and stone buildings were left as burnt-out remains. The fire kept raging all through Monday. It was only when the rain started on Monday evening that the inferno began to calm down. Finally, in the early hours of Tuesday, the last of the flames were put out by the rain. It was a relief, but by then, the damage was done, and Chicago had changed forever. The Aftermath of the Great Chicago Fire The massive wall of fire that tore through the heart of Chicago wiped out a corridor that was about four miles long and over a mile wide. The destruction to the city was mind-boggling. Almost all government buildings, newspapers, hotels, and major businesses were turned to ashes. There are heartbreaking tales of losing irreplaceable stuff, like letters written by Abraham Lincoln and original photo negatives of classic portraits of Lincoln snapped by Chicago photographer Alexander Hesler. It was a real blow to the city's history and heritage. About 120 bodies were found, but it's believed that over 300 people lost their lives. The intense heat was so fierce that some bodies might have been completely burned away. The damage was staggering, property worth around $190 million was gone. Over 17,000 buildings were turned to rubble, leaving more than 100,000 people without a home. Word about the fire spread fast thanks to telegraphs. In no time, newspaper artists and photographers rushed to the city to capture the enormous scenes of devastation, making sure the world knew about the tragedy in Chicago. Chicago was rebuilt after the Great Fire. After the disaster, relief efforts kicked into gear, and the U.S. Army took charge of Chicago, putting it under martial law. Generous contributions poured in from eastern cities, and even President Ulysses S. Grant pitched in $1,000 from his own pockets for the relief work. Despite being a major 19th-century catastrophe and a huge setback for Chicago, the city managed to rebuild quite swiftly. The silver lining was that the reconstruction brought about better construction practices and much stricter fire safety rules. The hard lessons learned from Chicago's destruction influenced how other cities were run. So, even though the tale of Mrs. O'Leary and her cow still lingers, the real culprits were simply a long, dry summer and a city made mostly of wood. And there you have it, a quick look at the dramatic tale of the Great Chicago Fire. If you found this journey through history intriguing, give us a thumbs up and make sure to subscribe to, a quick note, for more bite-sized explorations into the past. Thanks for joining us today, and until next time, stay curious.